let's talk about yeah okay so I um I wanted to cover a thing that came up in the preliminary chapter of Judson which by now supposedly all of you have read and um, this unlike the previous stuff will happen entirely within the category of set sets which is denoted set uh, where objects are sets and morphisms are functions. Um, just because we haven't really developed enough machinery to handle this in more generality. So, um, thing number one, um, there exists thing there exist morphisms called inclusions. If we have two sets, A and B, and one is a subset of the other, then we can form a function i from a to b, which is defined by the equation i of x equals x. Um, note that this is not the same as the identity, because even though the identity is defined by the same equation, in the category of sets, if you remember the first seminar, the identity goes from a set to itself. So you either consider, like if we drew a commutative diagram, that, okay, A, B. <laughs> this can be an inclusion, but the identities will have to go here and here. So these are actually different morphisms, even though they are defined by the same equation. Now, it is easy to verify that if you have two inclusions, then the composite inclusion is also an inclusion. And so this diagram commutes. Um, does this need clarification? Well, the, 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 like if we denote this with I1, this with I2, this with I3, then the composition of I2, composition I1 of X would be the I2 of I1 of X, which would just be X. And by the same token, I3 of X is just X. So on all, bit, on all in inputs, these two functions give the same output. Um, so the, they are the same function, and thus this diagram commutes. Um, great. Now, let's talk about images. Again, in the category of sets. Suppose we have some function f from a to b. Uh, a, b, f. Um, we are considering subsets of b, that is, sets x with an inclusion. Um, yeah, I should probably mention that an inclusion is always a monomorphism. So... It is, it is always injective. That should be obvious. Is it though? Um, so this is a monomorphism. Uh, so we are interested in subsets of B, that is set, set X with an inclusion into B, with a morphism from A to X, so morphism G, such that this diagram commutes. So uh, f equals uh, g composition i, for those who forgot what the commutative diagram means. Um, now, the, like if we unfold this definition, it looks fairly absurd in the sense that we just say, oh, whoa, that is a mistake, f equals i composition g. Um, if we unfold this definition, it looks fairly absurd, f of x equals g of x. But it's important to notice that g, like we consider subsets of b, 
such that G goes into that set. So we're like, um, you could think of G being uh, a restriction of F onto a smaller codomain. That's pretty much what we are doing here. Now, yeah, consider, consider, um, consider all such uh, pairs X and G. Now, as you might guess, this is another universal property, and there is a universal object that satisfies it. In this case, the universal object is the image of F, that is, the set of all points that F takes. And we can draw a commutative diagram. We have the image of F here. It is obviously a subset of B, and so there is an inclusion. But, and there is a morphism we can form. I'm going to call it F tilde. It is defined by this very same equation. Uh, F tilde of X equals F of X. But the codomain of F tilde is the image of F. Um, a... Uh, now, if we had any other set X with some function G and an inclusion, um, uh, I should run this differently, but the inclusion would go like this. Fuck. It's hard to draw on this part. <sighs> Never mind, you get the idea. Um, the, if we had some, some other set X with an inclusion and uh, some function G, such that the outer triangle commutes, like this G, I, and F, if this commutes, then there exists a unique inclusion from X. No? That doesn't seem correct. The inclusion goes in the opposite way. Um, then there exists a unique morphism from the image to X, which is an inclusion. So what this statement says is if we are restricting F to some set X, to, to, we restrict the codomain of F to some set X, uh, which is manifested by G, like G and I, G, composition of G and I being equal to F, and so G is defined by this equation here. And so it is, well, essentially the same equation. So if, if we are restricting the codomain of F to some set X, then that set will include the image of F. And in that sense, image of F is the unique object, is the universal object that satisfies the property of being a subset of, of the codomain while also having a morphism that commutes with F. And uh, another property of F tilde, like this morphism from A to the image of F, um, is that F tilde is surjective. So it's an epimorphism. We can denote this with the second arrow. Thanks. Um, F, of sur F is surjective, well, that follows trivially from, like, this defin these definitions here. Suppose um, X, not X, suppose Y is in the image of F, then uh, by definition of image, there exists an X such that F of X equals Y, and that same thing equals F of tilde of x. So f tilde is surjective. Now also if f is injective 
that is f of a equals f of b implies a equals b. If f is injective, then f tilde is also injective because if f tilde of a equals f tilde of b, then by the definition of f tilde, this statement here also holds and thus a equals b. So if f injective, then also f tilde injective. Right. Now, oh, yeah. And since f tilde is always surjective, then in that case, uh, in that case, f tilde is a bijection, in case f is an injection. Um, now, let's consider um, quotient sets. Suppose we have some set, uh, yeah, we have some set, and we have an equivalence relation, so some kind of thing, tilde, um, which is formally a subset of A times A, uh, but yeah, it is an equivalence relation, so it is symmetric, reflexive, and transitive. That should be covered in Judson. Um, so, uh, we consider some object X and a morphism F from A to X satisfying the property that uh, if X is, is related to Y by this relation here, then F of X equals f of y. So we consider all such f's from a such that for related values f outputs the same result. Um, tangential, tangential question and equivalence relation can never be from a set a times b. No, an equivalence relation on A is a binary relation on A. So it takes an element of A on the left and an element of A on the right. Um, so, as you know from the preliminaries chapter, if you have an equivalence relation on some set, then you can form the so-called quotient set a slash tilde, the set of equivalence classes of A under this equivalence relation. And you also have a function that naturally comes with this quotient from A to the set of equivalence classes of A, uh, usually denoted by square brackets. So like if you have um, uh, uh, if you have some element x, then square brackets of x is the equivalence class of x. That is the set of all y where x is related to y. So, uh, let's uh, separate this. So you have this morphism from a to a slash, slash tilde. Now, you probably see where I'm going, going with this. A slash tilde is a universal, um, it is a universal object for this property because, well, first of all, if X is related, uh, first of all, it satisfies the property. If X is related to Y, then the equivalence class of X and the equivalence class of Y is the same. So, it satisfies a property. Um, actually, let me move this a little closer. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Suppose we had some other function. Uh, we had we had some object x, 
and we had some other function f. And suppose that f satisfies this equation, equation. then as you've seen done in Judson, perhaps informally, we can define a function f star. f star will go from a slash tilde, f star, um, that maps the equivalence class of the element x to wherever f will take x. Now, Judson is concerned with the question of whether this equation defines a function. Like, is, is f star defined by this equation even a function? Um, the answer is yes, and it is guaranteed by this condition that related elements are mapped to the same output. So f star is a well-defined function, and from the very virtue, from, from like this very definition, it is apparent that f star composition the square brackets thingy is the same as f. So this diagram here commutes. Um, f star is also unique because if we start with this condition that f star composition brackets equals f, then we get immediately to this equation and it completely determines what f star is. It determines f star on all inputs. Now, Mm. So, the quotient set, a slash tilde, is the universal object among objects with morphisms that satisfy the property that related values are mapped to the same output. Now, another property, a, a property that it satisfies is that um, if f is surjective, if f is surjective, then f tilde o f star is surjective. Uh, why? Well, because uh, suppose we have um, suppose we have some y such that there exists an f. No, 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 no. Suppose we have some y, then there exists an element that is the equivalence class of x such that f star will map the equivalence class of x to y where x is whatever maps like x is whatever maps to y by f um, and now we are ready to consider something that is, well, I guess I borrowed this idea from Alafi, but uh, here we go. Um, suppose we have, well, this will be a big diagram. Uh, suppose we have two objects, two sets in this case, A and B, and a morphism from A to B. First, we will, mm, yeah, we will form an equivalence relation on A defined by um, X is related to Y if and only if F of X equals F of Y. So we define an equivalence relation by from a function in this case. This is obviously a an equivalence relation um, I'll let you verify that it satisfies the axioms. It's true for any f. Um, so now suppose, so yeah, we, we've defined this equivalence relation. Now we can take the quotient set over this equivalence relation and we will get the square brackets thingy in this subjective. Um, yeah, it is, uh, so we have, we have A into A over tilde by the universal property, and we have this morphism here, uh, F star. 
but also from the slide just before that, we can take this morphism F star and consider its image, image of F star, which happens to be the same thing as the image of F. Also easy to verify, which is a subset of B. So there's an inclusion. And there is a unique morphism that goes like this, F tilde. And uh, so to begin with, uh, what we were supposed to prove. Uh, yeah, there is a morphism from A over tilde to B. F star is injective. Um, OK, we can show that F star is injective because um, if F star of some equivalence class X is equal to F star to some equivalence class Y, then X is related to Y then that means well by the virtue of like wait why star takes to be oh yeah f star um equals f of x by the de by the definition of f star and that's this equals f of y and if these two things are equal then x is related to y and uh thus they are the same equivalence class so f star is injective sorry i'm not following no no if no uh, no 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 f star is always injective regardless of f it's the square brackets operation that takes an element to its equivalence class that part is surjective Yeah, F star is always injective. I have the proof on here, here on the slide. Now, F star is injective, and we constructed F tilde out of F star. And um, we've proved before that if this thing here is an injection, then F tilde is an isomorphism. Well, a bijection, which is the same thing as an isomorphism in the category of sets. And so we have for any morphism F, I will redraw the diagram in more clear and uh, whatever. For any morphism F, like any morphism F can be decomposed into a surjection onto some quotient of its domain, an isomorphism to some subset of the codomain and then an injection into the into the into the codomain and this works from any for any function on sets this uh, in an algebra course this a, a statement similar to this would be called the first isomorphism theorem but usually the first isomorphism theorem is considered for groups and rings and not for sets like this. Yes, the double tip is surjective, hook is injective. Um, for bijective, the only notation that I know of is to just draw an arrow without the tip. This would be notation, but yeah, uh, if, if there's no tip, that's a bijection. Well, kind of because you can, you know, make it work the other way around. 
Yeah. So um, normally a really similar theorem would be proved for groups and rings, and we will prove that at, uh, at, at, at some future point. Uh, but I just wanted to show that this principle of decomposition into a of any de decomposing any function into a surjection and an injection, this principle works for even as for things as general as even sets. Um, hmm. That's pretty much all I wanted to say for today. And um, now, yeah, okay. Uh, are are there any questions with the content that we covered for now? I know this is maybe stupid, but do you know any concrete examples? This would be like a little bit more obvious. Okay, let's do a concrete example. Yeah, concrete examples. Um, we could um, consider. Suppose we have the function that takes the absolute value from z to z. Whatever. I'm not going to be wrong this. Um, it take a function that takes the absolute value. So first and foremost, well, usually denoted by bars. Uh, first and foremost, um, x is the same as minus x. So, yeah, first we define an equivalence relation, x is related to y, if and only if absolute value of x is equal to the absolute value of y. Now, this is only possible if x and y are opposites, so x is e equivalent to y if and only if, let me drag this a bit, um, x is equivalent to y if and only if x equals negative y. So, this is the equivalence relation that is generated by this function here. So, first thing we consider is this set of integers quotiented by, by this equivalence relation. What does that look like? So, we consider the set of equivalence classes of this of of this of this relation um normally well this is just the set of natural numbers why because well it's isomorphic to the set of natural numbers um there for for a for every natural number there is a an equivalence class of x and minus x like uh, for all x for any natural x that that this is what the set of equivalence classes looks like and um, now naturally we have the the so we can get from a an integer to the equivalence class, well, basically with this formula. Um, but so we, we have this z over tilde. Holy fuck, I'm retarded. No one draws z's like that. Why the fuck did I draw them like this? There was nothing wrong with them. <laughs> no, there was. There was. But isn't it true because it's going to give a positive therefore neutral number? Isn't what true? Well, what you just did. I, 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 never mind. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the set of equivalence classes. So we can we can kind of. Uh, state explicitly that the equivalence class of some number x 
is the set absolute value of x and negative absolute value of x, if, if we want to go really explicit here. Um, now, the we have an induced function from the set of equivalence classes uh, that goes f of the equivalence class of x is equal to the absolute value of x. Now that would be f star by our old definitions. Now, what is the image of this of this function? That would of course be the natural numbers. So the image of the absolute value function is the natural numbers because well we can only get a non-negative result. And um, I've kind of already spoiled it. But, yeah, this is the isomorphism. We have, um, we have Z. We have Z here. We have a function between them, abs. We have natural numbers, a subset of Z. So there's an inclusion here. And we have the, equivalence, the, the set of equivalence classes Z over tilde into which we have the surjection and as i said here z over tilde is isomorphic to n and so we have the isom the bijection here this is a concrete example of the theorem we had before that, that makes absolute perfect sense thank you yeah I, like i understand way better because i great couldn't really get a grip Jacob wanted to um, go over the initial objects, right? Yeah. The dual of terminal. Let's do that. Initial objects. So it is the concept, the concept that is completely dual to the uh, concept of terminal objects. An initial object is usually denoted by the symbol zero. And so the definition of, the, of an initial object is that it is some object zero, such that for any other object x, there exists a unique morphism from zero to x. Uh, now, I don't actually know the symbol that's usually used for this, so let's call it f. Upside down exclamation mark. Uh, probably not. If anything, it could it could be the question mark, or the zero, or just the zero. Not sure. Would need to check N lab. Um. So yeah, for any for any other object, there is a morphism from the zero to that object, and it, the morphism is unique. Uh, in sets, what would be this object? Well, that would be the empty set. That's horrible. Okay, um, it would be the empty set uh, because for any set X, there is a function from the empty set to the set X. The function is unique. The function is defined by saying that we don't map anything anywhere. The graph of the function is empty because this, the domain is empty. That might not make, that, that might not make much sense, but if you look at the definition of what a function is, uh, well, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, there's no like yeah. set. It's, therefore there's no there, there, are, there are no inputs, so you don't need to specify any outputs. Um, in finite dimensional vector spaces, over the reals, uh, the initial object is the null space with just one element, and the, f the linear map from the null space to some vector space V would be defined by just mapping the zero vector to the zero vector in V. Uh, Nini is typing. 
So I can have the domain of a function be the empty set. Yes. The cat in the category of sets, any well, objects are all sets, including the empty set. Uh, here's actually something more surprising. Um, you can have a function. Um, well, let's, let's not say x. Um, you can have a function from y into the empty set. But if and only if y is the empty set itself. So uh, there is exactly one function from the empty set to itself, and that's the identity on the empty set. But for any other y, for any non-empty y, there is no such function. Um, in particular, the this idea is used if we want to interpret logic categorically we might consider some empty some an analog of an empty set and consider functions into it and then uh that would be the negation of the statement because uh the function only exists if the source is also false, in this case, the empty set. Um, okay, um, what were our other examples? We had the power set of u under inclusion. The initial object in that would be some set such that it is a subset of any other set. What would that be? That would be, of course, the same thing, the empty set. Empty set is a subset of anything. Now, natural numbers under less than or equal to, it would be some natural number n, such that it is less than or equal to m uh, for all m. What would that be? That is zero. So zero is the initial object of natural numbers. Now, we had a theorem about how an initial object is unique up to a unique isomorphism. The th like there is a completely analogous proof for the initial object. Yeah, we proved the theorem for terminal objects and there is a completely like analogous proof for initial objects. It goes literally the same way. Suppose suppose we had two, two initial objects, zero, one and zero, two, then there is an isom then there is a morphism ID from the first object to itself. And like the there are morphisms that go like this and like this, and their composition that would necessarily have to be ID because there's only one morphism here. And so these two morphisms are inverses of each other. Literally the same thing as with terminal objects. Though... Yeah, you know how it's the, the opposite of the terminal. So, well, it, it is more interesting when, with terminal objects because in the category of sets, there are actually multiple terminal objects. Any set with exactly one element is a terminal object, and they are all in bijection with each other because they have the same number of elements. With initial objects, is less interesting because there's only one empty set. Um, anything, uh, anything else you want me to cover? Because otherwise I'm going to end this here. I think I'm okay personally. Uh, yeah, there was something, but I can't really find it, but yeah, so you could just edit it here in the next time I ask. Okay, well then, let's end it here. Excellent, thank you so much. It was very nice. You're welcome.